Hey YouTube, welcome back to the Crazy Cycling Channel and what should be video number five in my series on wheel building. And in today's video, I'm gonna be talking about spoke lacing patterns. Now, there are two aspects to this. The first one is the spoke cross pattern, which refers to the number of spokes each spoke crosses on its way between the hub and the rim. And then the second aspect is the orientation of the leading and the trailing spokes. So if you look at any bicycle wheel, you should see that half the spokes are angling away from the hub in one direction and half are angling away from the hub in the other direction. And let's say that you're cycling off to my left or off to your right. So your tire would be turning this way, your wheel would be turning that way. And you can see that there are certain spokes that are kind of pointing towards the direction of travel and there are other spokes that are pointing away from the direction of travel and the ones pointing towards the direction of travel are your leading spokes and the ones that are pointing away from the direction of travel are the trailing spokes and if you look at your hub you can see that um, leading spokes all come out of one side of the hub flange and trailing spokes come out of the other side but you can change which side the leading and trailing spokes come, off, come out of. Okay, so let's talk about spoke cross pattern first. And this is a concept that is really easy to understand. And basically, the higher the number of crossings, the better a wheel will be at resisting the torsional forces that develop within that wheel. And those torsional forces come from either pedaling for the back wheel or from braking if you have disc brakes. So the easiest way to think about this is to think about a radially spoked wheel. And a radially spoked wheel has no crosses. In that case, the spokes come straight out from the hub and they're essentially perpendicular with the rim. And that means that the only way the spokes have to resist those torsional forces is by bending. And spokes are pretty weak in bending, so that will make a pretty weak rim or pretty weak wheel. Now, as you increase the number of crossings, the spokes become more and more parallel with the rim, and that allows the spokes to also partially resist those torsional forces in tension. And spokes are very, very strong in tension, so the higher the number of crossings, the more parallel the spokes will be with the rim, the more the spokes will be able to act in tension, and the stronger the wheel will be. However, there is a practical limit which is that if you increase the crossings too much, the spokes can start to interfere with each other at the hub. So the practical limit for most wheels is a four cross wheel, you, uh, sorry, a three cross wheel. You might see four cross sometimes, um, especially if you have a higher spoke count, but in general, your strongest wheel will be a three cross wheel. And then a two cross is slightly less strong. A one cross is obviously less strong again. And a radially spoked wheel in my opinion, just shouldn't really be used, but especially for disc brakes, and it really shouldn't be used for the, for the back wheel as well. Okay, and now we come to the orientation of the leading and trailing spokes. And in order to visualize this a bit better, imagine that this hub is part of a wheel which is rolling off to my left or your right. So the hub would be spinning like so, and some of the spokes would be coming out of the hub like this, those would be the trailing spokes, and other spokes would be coming out of the hub like this, and those would be the leading spokes. And the key thing to remember is just as with cross pattern, the spokes essentially can't resist any sort of forces in compression. So the spokes that are resisting the load are always going to be the ones that are in tension. So for a rear wheel on the drive side, it is the trailing spokes that are resisting the forces caused by pedaling. Now, for the front hub or the non-drive side of a rear hub, it is actually the leading spokes that resist those forces because um, the spokes really aren't doing very much as the wheel is just spinning. But when you apply the brakes, that essentially means that the um, hub is trying to pull back. And so the tension that develops within the leading spokes is resisting those forces that develop. Okay, so now for simplicity, let's just look at the drive side of the rear wheel, which means that the trailing spokes are the ones resisting 
that torsional force that develops. Now, should those trailing spokes be oriented uh, heads in or heads out? In other words, should these spokes be oriented so that they sit on the outside edge of the hub flange, like so, or the inside edge of the hub flange, like so? Well, this is something I, I can't show you that well, but the traditional thought was that the trailing spokes should be on the inside of the flange, and there are basically two reasons for that. You probably won't be able to see this very well, but the first reason is that those trailing spokes on their way to the rim will cross one leading spoke, and the key is that they will cross, if they're on the inside, will cross that leading spoke on the outside and support that leading spoke at the point of crossing. And the theory is that as you pedal, those leading spokes will slacken slightly and the trailing spokes will prevent the leading spokes from buckling outward because if a spoke slackens too much, it could bend outward like this. And the theory is that that could interfere with potentially your chain or your derailleur or your brakes. And the other reason that people say that, or traditionally it, the trailing spokes were on the inside is because that protects the spoke in case your chain derails between the cassette and the wheel because then the chain will be rubbing against spokes and the trailing spokes are more important. So it's better if that chain damages, I mean, it's not good if it damages spokes, but it's better if it rubs against the leading spokes than the trailing spokes. All right, so this thought process is what you will find, for example, on the Sheldon Brown wheel building website. And, and to me, that is the traditional way of building a wheel. And the thing is that this method was invented before disc brakes were. So in that method, you basically have trailing spokes on the inside everywhere because there aren't torsional forces at all within the front wheel because you have rim brakes. And there also aren't significant torsional forces on the non-drive side of the rear wheel. So to make things easy, you just always had your trailing spokes to the inside. But then two things happened. First of all, disc brakes were invented and this meant that the forces were basically opposite on the non-drive drive side of the rear wheel and on both sides of the front wheel. And in order to counteract that, all you had to do is you just had to lace the wheels opposite um, on the non-drive side of the rear wheel or on the front wheel. Okay, and then the other thing that happened is that Shimano came along and they said that you should essentially do the opposite of the traditional method. And their reasoning is that if you have, for example, on the drive side of your rear hub, if you have the trailing spokes on the outside, and this is where they were traditionally always done on the inside, the hub flange itself helps support the spoke. And this actually makes a lot of sense once you start to think about it, because as you pedal, your trailing spokes will tend to straighten and that will tend to bend the spoke here at the J-bend. And if your trailing spokes are on the inside, the spoke will tend to bend right in the corner of that J-bend. And that is a point where the spoke is fairly weak. But if you have your trailing spokes on the outside of the hub, the hub flange will actually press against the spoke a little bit further down. And that means that the spoke will actually be bending a little bit further away from the J-bend and that will protect the J-bend from breaking. And that honestly makes a lot of sense to me. And the other thing is that what doesn't make that much sense about the traditional way of building wheels is that I don't think the trailing spokes really need to support the leading spokes from the outside at the cross. And my thinking there is that in theory, your spokes should never slacken completely. And spokes that even have a little bit of tension on them should always be perfectly straight in theory, right? Maybe I'm missing something there, but I don't think there's a good reason for your spokes uh, buckling outward. Um, so the Shimano method makes a lot of sense to me. And then of course, everywhere else, you basically do the opposite of that. You have your um, trailing spokes on the inside because the forces are opposite to what they are on the drive side of the rear wheel. Okay, so then the last question is, 
how do you actually lace a wheel in practical terms when you're using the Shimano method? Because with the Shimano method, you will basically have asymmetrical lacing on the rear wheel. On the front wheel, your spokes will be laced the same on either side of the hub. But on the rear wheel, um, your spokes will be laced opposite on opposite sides of the hub. And um, the best wheel building guide online is the Sheldon Brown website. And that method uses a key spoke. And if you're not that familiar with this or familiar with, with wheel building, I'd suggest going there to follow along. But basically, if you look from the right side of the wheel, which is this side, in the Shimano method, your key spoke will be to the, oh, sorry, in the normal traditional method, your key spoke will be clockwise from the valve hole. And then your um, first spokes on the other side of the hub will be clockwise more from that key spoke. And you also lace the inside spokes first. And then when you go to um, twist your hub and twisting the hub sets where the leading and trailing spokes are, you twist clockwise. And that sets the wheel so that you have the trailing spokes on the inside of the, of the flange. And when you're using the Shimano method and you're building a front wheel, you basically follow those exact same instructions because you want the trailing spokes on the inside of the flange and you'll end up with a correctly built wheel. I just realized that I told you something that was wrong because I just said that the first set of spokes you lace from the left side of the hub will come uh, one spoke hole further to the right from the valve hole when viewed from the right side of the wheel. And that's sometimes true, but it actually depends on how the rim is drilled because rims are drilled with the uh, spoke holes offset to the left and right. And if your key spoke is exactly to the right of the valve hole, that is true. But if your key spoke is two away from the valve hole, your second set of spokes, which are the first set of spokes on the left side of the wheel, will come exactly next to the valve hole, which is counterclockwise from the key spoke. Regardless of whether the first spoke from the left side of the hub attaches to the rim clockwise or counterclockwise from the key spoke, when building a front wheel using the Shimano method, you always turn the hub clockwise in order to set the orientation of the leading and trailing spokes properly. But what about when you're building a rear wheel? Well, it just so happens that I have a partially built uh, rear wheel here. This is the wheel from my Fairlight Ferron. And I'm building this wheel using the Shimano method. And when you build a rear wheel using the Shimano method, the only difference is that you lace the first right side set of spokes from the inside of the hub out. You still attach the spokes in the same way. You still attach your first key spoke, which is the first one laced on the right side, either one or two clockwise from the valve hole. Um, but aside from that, everything else is exactly the same. So you lace the first set of spokes on the drive side from the inside of the hub out. And then you go back to the non-drive side and you lace your first spokes from the outside in. And then in order to set the orientation of the leading and trailing spokes, you still rotate the hub clockwise because by rotating the hub clockwise, you're setting where the trailing spokes are. And now in the Shimano method, you then end up with the trailing spokes on the outside of the hub flange on the right side of the wheel. And after that, you just carry on lacing your wheel as normal. The only thing to watch out for is that since you've laced the first set of spokes from the inside of the hub outward, you then have to lace spokes from the outside of the hub inward. And the spokes from the left side of the wheel will be in the way as you orient them to the holes in the rim. So you have to kind of bend them and guide them around the spokes a little bit more. And I would definitely recommend next lacing the second set of spokes from the right side of the wheel rather than the left side, because if you do that, the final set of spokes will be from the inside out and then you won't have any spokes in the way. But that's really all there is to the Shimano method. It's actually not that, that complicated. I'm gonna do a standalone video on this topic. I'll publish it at the same time as this video, just because I searched a lot online how to actually do this. And 
I couldn't find any information. I mean, I found the Shimano pattern, but nobody really explained how to actually do it in practice. Um, so in case someone's looking for that, then they can look that up. But it's actually not as complicated as, as it might seem at first. It's, it's still the same. You, you still rotate clockwise. You still orient everything exactly the same. It's just that you start off lacing from the inside out on the right side of the wheel. Okay, I hope that all kind of made sense. And I just want to finish by saying that all of this theory about which side of the uh, flanges the spoke should be laced on actually doesn't really make a huge difference. The Shimano method makes sense to me because it makes sense to me that you want to protect that J-bend and the hub flange supporting the spoke would do that. But it, it's such a little thing that if you do it a different way, it really doesn't matter. It, it doesn't really matter. So many things in wheel building end up not mattering. Um, but that's kind of the theory about how that works. Um, and the other thing I want to say is just that wheel building, at least for me, is something that every time I do it, I kind of have to relearn it and, and think about it. And um, once you've done a few, you kind of get an understanding of how the little changes you make change uh, how the spokes are oriented around the valve hole, for example, and how you can lace the spokes with the leading and trailing spokes in different orientations. Um, so if my, uh, if my explanation didn't make that much sense, I would recommend going to the Sheldon Brown website, which has diagrams of all this stuff. You can also check the Park Tool video, which always makes really good videos. And then just get a wheel, get a rim and a hub if you're gonna build a wheel. And you'll probably have to relace it a couple times anyway, at least I do every time because I always make mistakes. But by making those mistakes, you'll start to see how your changes affect the lacing pattern. And hopefully you'll learn something. But hopefully this video was informative Thanks as always for watching. I appreciate it very much. Please consider subscribing and maybe I'll see you in the next one. Thanks, take care and have a great day.